Then you have it. A coat of arms. <laughs> revived. They are revived. And they're going to be revered by the whole wide world. They've toppled the late queen and the late duke. And the existing king is dying. And Catherine's on her way out. And they're all shrinking away. But guess what? We're going to take over. And Biden's doddering off into the sunset. <laughs> tripping over his words and his flip-flops and uh, America needs a new presidency a new hope and there's talk of Michelle Obama taking on Mr. Trump in the upcoming palaver and the upcoming dramas <laughs> oh there's talk of all that but guess what Michelle you had your chance at becoming now I, Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, will transcend every side of the Atlantic and beyond through the Pacific to become Princess, Duchess, President and Empress of the World! <laughs>His Majesty the King has returned to London to continue his treatment for cancer. His Majesty and the Queen were seen driving from Buckingham Palace to Clarence House after flying in from Sandringham by helicopter. Queen Camilla will continue carrying out engagements as part of her very busy diary throughout the rest of the week. Welcome to the broadcast, my darlings. Let's dive right on in. Florian Costeau says, The good thing with the new Sussex Royal website is that our fruity river is gonna have a word or two, and I can't wait for that. Well, Mademoiselle Costeau, I'm presuming it's pronounced Costeau, but it's C-O-S-T-E-D-O-A-T. -E I haven't heard that surname before. Could be Costadoat. Costa Duar, but I'm going with Costa. Anyway, Florian, my dear, thank you for your comment. And yes, I will be holding forth on the subject of the day. The new, the new royal family have descended upon us, haven't they, my dears? But can we have a quick palate cleanser beforehand with this question from Melissa Quinn? River, would you explain what the Queen's title will be in the event, God forbid, King Charles passes away before she dies? Sorry, before, before she does. <laughs> I got distracted there, my dear. I must confess, it's one of my pet hates when people say, pass away or passes away. And don't write in if you're offended. I don't care. I don't care who's offended. The word is died. Uh, let's not dress things up in a sort of bourgeois middle class fashion, my dear. One of the things that one has to do in life, including me and including all of you, is get our heads around the fact that we're all going in the same direction, whether that's heaven or hell or absolutely nowhere or limbo we are all going to die and I truly believe that death should be as it is in some other cultures around the world part of growing up nothing whatsoever to boot we should be able to say the word and face it I'm getting distracted here my dear but it's one of those things that I truly believe that children should be exposed to to take away any morbidity uh, is that the word any morbid fascination or fear it's a fear that we, we're, we're all going to kick the bucket, my dear, so we should face it with fruity humour. Uh, you know, we're just a blip in time. This is where phrases like the words, pass away, take me, so do excuse me, my dear, but I get exercised. Back to the question. Uh, God forbid if King Charles passes away before she does and William ascends to the throne. What's the Queen's title going to be? I assume Catherine would become Queen, but Camilla is not William's mother, and I don't see how Queen Mother would work. I love your work and sending big hugs from New England, USA. Well, big hugs to you, my dear Melissa Quinn. Big hugs to you. If the King passes... If the King... <laughs> if the King dies before Camilla... She goes from Queen Consort to Queen Dowager. 
And as Queen Dowager, she would not go by that style in public. That would be her private situation. Queen Dowager, but in public, she would remain Queen Camilla, as Queen Mary did, for example, when she became widow to King George V. She remained known as Her Majesty Queen Mary, and that is how Camilla will be known, Her Majesty Queen Camilla. She will just be in private Queen Dowager, and Catherine will become the Queen Consort, and there will be no Queen Regnant, we will have a king, but you know, there are those different types of queens. Queen Elizabeth was a queen regnant, born with her destiny sealed as a queen. We have consorts in the, in the fashion of Camilla and the likes of Catherine. And uh, seldom queen regent as well. A queen can become regent. Very, very rare, but can happen. And of course, queen mother is the other kind of queen. But in order to qualify as a Queen Mother, if you take it on as your public style, you must not only be mother to a Queen or a King, as the late Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother was, but you must also have been a Queen yourself, as she was in the form of consort to King George VI. The incumbent Princess of Wales, of course, will become Queen Consort to William, but she will go by Queen Catherine publicly. Now, we will hit that subject that dear Florian mentioned. <laughs> the office of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. We have been summoned to the office. <laughs> it reminds me of that Ricky Gervais effort, the office. That is exactly how I imagine it, my dear, with some pontificating, except charmless less charm than Ricky Gervais's character. What is it? David Brent in the office? Well, that is what it stirs up for me. These co this, this catastrophe of the royal house of Sussex sprung up in Montecito. You couldn't make it up, could you? And moreover, in America, of all places, they want to establish a new royal household, a new palace in America. The arrogance, the vanity, the deviousness and the spite and the malice behind all this and the gaslighting. That actually was my first thought when it popped, popped up in the news. It was the gaslighting. If anybody out there is yet to be convinced, by the way, of what they are all about, then they are frankly to be pitied. That's all I can tell you. You're to be pitied if you don't see what they're all about. If you don't know, the Archwell website has been replaced. The Archwell Foundation still exists, but if you were to type in archwell.com, that will lead you to sussex.com, which has been seized by the Sussexes. The office of Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, welcome you to their quarters. <laughs> You've got to take this with a slice of humour, my dear, or it is just too tragic to, to contemplate. A streamlining of a kind is what they're calling it, a base for their communications, a one-stop shop for all things Sussex. Royal, whisper it, royal. A royal household in America, really. And then, and then we have the coup d'etat or the nonsense on stilts, whichever way you want to look at the lollipop, the shiny or fuzzy end. Then you have it, a coat of arms, <laughs> revived, they are revived and they're going to be revered by the whole wide world. They've toppled the late queen and the late duke and the existing king is dying and Catherine's on her way out and they're all shrinking away. But guess what? We're going to take over. And Biden's doddering off into the sunset, <laughs> tripping over his words and his flip-flops. And uh, America needs a new presidency, a new hope. And there's talk of Michelle Obama taking on Mr. Trump in the upcoming palaver and the upcoming dramas. <laughs> Oh, there's talk of all that, but guess what? Michelle, 
you had your chance at becoming. Now I, Megan, the Duchess of Sussex, will transcend every side of the Atlantic and beyond through the Pacific to become Princess, Duchess, President, and Empress of the World! <laughs> and she even has a coat of arms to reflect it on display. <laughs> well, the office of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex is shaping the future through business and philanthropy. This includes the Archerwell Foundation, Archerwell Productions, patronages, ventures and organisations which receive the support of the couple individually or together and all together. How gracious of them. And by the way, they have a charm offensive towards Canada. They're going to try and wind in those in Canada who have become very woke over the past decade or so. That charm offensive, that three-day jamboree will begin in earnest tomorrow. I think it's a three-day affair. So watch out. The worldwide privacy tour is back in motion as if it ever stopped. And this time it's under the office. The office of the Duke and Duchess. And it seems rather evident to me that they are aiming to keep as much of the Sussex Royal brand that they previously used and then agreed to abandon when they upped and left. They want to keep as much of that brand as possible after being made to drop the, ro the word royal. It's, al it's almost as if somebody said, well, OK, we're not going to use the word royal. So in order to make up for that, we are going to plaster all over our new branding and our new website everything that denotes royalty if we're not allowed to use the world. We'll just tell everyone, we'll make a big meal of the fact that he's a prince and we'll put up a coat of arms, which is actually Meghan's, and we will refer to our children with their full titles, Prince Archie and Prince Lilibet, rather than Archie and Lily, and make it very clear that we are just a step above everybody else. Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, is a humanitarian, a military veteran, a mental health advocate and environmental campaigner. An environmental campaigner that takes a trip from California to Heathrow for a 10 minute meeting with Papa and then back again. Prince Harry lives in California with his wife, Meghan, and their two children, Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet. Oh, those names. They look so ugly together, I'm sorry. But it looks terrible. It looks as if they are names from some distant fable, but not in a good way. Not in a good way. Princess Lilibet. It sounds like a frog princess, and it's no disparagement to the child or to the name Lilibet. We all know that it's suited so wonderfully, the late Queen. And Lily would sound nice on Princess Lily, but Princess Lilibet, uh, Prince Archie. It sounds like a frog chorus to me, and it is no disparagement to those poor children. It is just simply how it comes across. Princess Lilibet sounds daft, absolutely daft, because it's out of context. And why the formality, can I ask? Man and uh, woman of the people who need no royal title. It's a real Earl Spencer moment, isn't it? They need no royal title to uh, fulfill their duties. And anyone can serve, anyone can serve. You don't own the word royal, then why so formal, guys? Why not just call yourself, hi, it's Harry and Meghan. It's Harry and Meghan, what's wrong with that? And they have received quite a torrent of criticism. A source close to the couple has been quoted as rebuffing the criticism and says Prince Harry and Meghan are, they are the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. It, that is a fact. It is their surname and family name. Well, they do have a point in one way. Although I wouldn't necessarily include it as their surname or family name, I would say their family name is more along the lines of Mountbatten Windsor, which is why they've given those names to their children. We know that there are blurred lines when it comes to surnames for members of the royal family because, strictly speaking, they don't really possess them. Although Meghan 
the last one of the last times we saw one of her official documents was on Lilibet's birth certificate where she signed off as Rachel Markle. So if Markle was good enough for her then, why can't it be good enough for her now? And why can't her husband take the name Markle if he's not happy being a Mountbatten Windsor or with his uh, princely upbringing? Then take on Markle, be Harry and Meg Markle. Why not? I am actually deadly serious about this. She is the home of femininity. She is the font and the fountainhead of womanhood and the suffragette movement. So why not just call themselves the Markles and be done with it and get on with their reality TV show at home with the Markle Harkles? You might be asking yourself, so why do I have a problem with them using names which belong to them colloquially because colloquially of course it is absolutely acceptable to call them Harry and Meghan Sussex and that is why I will often refer to them as Harry and Meghan Sussex and you'll ask me why but it is because that is in our sort of world how one would refer to Harry and Meghan, Harry Sussex, Meghan Sussex, Andrew and Sarah York, uh, Catherine and William Cambridge as they were, you know, Kate to Cambridge. You know this is what goes in our world when Harry and Meghan Sussex goes, which is why I call them it. However, the ungraciousness, the ungraciousness and the disgrace is the fact that the dukedom was actually a gift from the late Queen. One that I'm sure she went on to bitterly regret. It was a, it was a wedding gift to them and uh, it could actually have been voluntarily surrendered along with the HRH styling if they had any integrity. If they had any integ integrity, they might have volunteered not to use that because now it is almost inextricably linked to Harry's frame. A dukedom is not something that can be ripped off and torn asunder easily to put it mildly but if they had had dignity and integrity and authenticity they might have volunteered to do that themselves but of course they didn't because it gives them their merching opportunities but when they left and damaged her reign that would have been the time to do it wouldn't it my objection is the continued invoking of everything and anything that denotes royalty as part of their public style because i see it as an abuse of their privilege and I'm sure Harry would be the first one to dress down others for abusing their privileges, but seems to be, not take a blind bit of notice as his. It is, a, it is their privilege, his privilege, through accident of birth. And uh, it was all originally provided to him on the proviso, really, or on the supposition that he is a servant of the peoples of this kingdom and all the realms as a servant not to run a foreign office abroad or a foundation or an entity or a wheeze let's just call it what it is a wheeze so what would appease the likes of me what would make me happy well ideally as I say Harry and Meghan Sussex, who know it still sticks in the craw that they carry the Sussex title, the dukedom, or Harry does, but if they would do that with no reference to the Duke and Duchess of, and no coat of arms, no Prince Harry, just Harry and Meghan, and without the HRH, keep that in private, then one wouldn't be quite so salty about it, do you understand? But this really really takes a biscuit it is really a poke in the eye to the existing members the working members of the royal family to think that they have the gumption the chutzpah and the sheer nerve nerve in fact a cowardly kind of nerve to to do this to rebrand themselves as the new royals i ask you 
In the press, it is claimed that they are going to have real trouble with the use of Sussex. It is a royal title, and if there is any hint of commercialism about this, as if there isn't any already, it will be shut down. It's just staggering. They cannot see how gauche it is. Well, why would they see how gauche it is, my dear? If they could see what was gauche, then we wouldn't have had the last four years existing in any format whatsoever. If they knew what was gauche, they wouldn't have appeared on Oprah Winfrey, tarnishing the late Queen's legacy and this kingdom. They have, if they see what gauche is, they ignore it. And then we move on to all this syrup about Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. Even Wikipedia gets that right, by the way, that it is Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, or the Duchess of Sussex, but not Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, is a feminist. Just in case you didn't know, had you not heard about her? She's a feminist and a champion of human rights and gender equity. Yawnsville, Yawnsville, Yawnsville. Her lifelong advocacy for women and girls remains a constant thread in her humanitarian and business ventures. She has been named, <laughs> this is the one, She's been named as one of the most influential women in the world in rankings, including Time magazine's most influential people. The uh, Financial Times 25 most influential women and variety power of women and British Vogue 25, British Vogue's 25. Well, she's not so much in vogue now, is she, with Edward Ellen for? And then it goes on and on, munching through word salad, word salad, and she even drags out the old Immaculate Fart again. Oh, I went to school at the Immaculate Heart. I really think that she sees herself as an Immaculate Heart and probably as some sort of divine mother. It's the Immaculate Heart all over again. And um, Oh, a New York Times best-selling author. Oh, oh, and then... <laughs> with the acclaimed children's book, The Bench. <laughs> Enid Blyton's rolling in her grave. And Roald Dahl is having a Welsh fit upstairs. Acclaimed, acclaimed author, authoress. Who exactly acclaimed her skills of poetry? It was absolutely dreadful. The only thing I will say about that, because it had nice pictures, I thought the illustrations were quite pleasant. But as for the contents, and I really did, I didn't buy a copy, but I really did pick one up in WH Smith and look through it just to see and check. And I was absolutely flabbergasted because I've met three-year-olds that can come up with more profound and more charming verse. And it went like this, goo goo ga ga goo goo ga ga. Um, and I noticed that they still provide a link adorned with their intertwined monogram, intertwined like the two banyan trees or whatever they are, the two palms, what was it, Montesquieu, uh, the two entwined plants. Well, they're, they're monograms, you click on them, the crowned monograms, and it leads you to the Sussex Royal website, the old one. It still takes you there. And there is an update from that site from 2020, so long after they're gone, that refers to them as the royal couple. Still refers to them, written in 2020, as the royal couple. Now, as for this coat of arms they've used, it was an interesting choice because the, the coat of arms that they are using is the one that represents the Duchess of Sussex only. And from my checking, that is the only one that they used throughout. It's an interesting choice. It also throws up le questions about what might have been in their minds, legally speaking, about using coats of arms. But it, the thing is, they might say that it represents both of them together because it has a lion and it has the songbird, which represents Megan. But actually it doesn't. This only represents Megan, this one that they have chosen to use. Harry, if you remember, was granted the coat of arms, not on his marriage, that was the dukedom. He was granted the coat of arms when he turned 18 
on his 18th birthday. And just to make clear the point about the royal dukedom, which was a wedding gift, it is a substantive title uh, and it is a hereditary title. And for those, for those of you that don't know, that means that as it stands and without any further interference or welcome change made this side of the shores, that means that Prince Archie is entitled to carry on that dukedom and become Duke of Sussex upon Harry's death. And even if he were to disclaim, even if he were brought up to be independent and anti-royal and make his way in the world and disclaim that title, his heir could then go on to reclaim it as theirs. It belongs to them even if it is disclaimed by somebody down the line. Do you understand? This is why some of us exercise it. It's not just about Harry and Meghan wielding their dukedom. It's the fact that their progeny and their spawn are able to uh, shuttle all over America and beyond exercising that type of privilege. Eternally. It's vulgar. Harry's coat of arms consists of the arms of the sovereign in right of the United Kingdom with the label for difference. The coat of arms for the Duchess of Sussex features two supporters as they are known, the lion supporter, which actually, when I deconstruct it, actually represents the crown and Harry's association to the crown rather than Harry himself. Although the Duchess bears the arms of the husband impaled with her own. And Meghan's supporter is the songbird, the songbird supporter that does represent her addition to this relationship. And as I understand it, her addition to Harry as a prince, because she became a princess of the United Kingdom, even if not publicly styled this way. My understanding is that the coat of arms is more closely linked to Harry's status as a prince and her affiliation as a princess rather than to the dukedom. And if you remember, of course, it features a quill which denotes her curlicued handwriting and her communication and her power of words. Well, we all know what power they have, disastrous kinds of power. And uh, golden Californian poppies because she knew where she was going to end up, didn't she? Back among the opioid, the gilded opioids of California. That's where exactly where she knew she was going to end up. So she slipped that in there on her coat of arms. And uh, blue to resemble the Pacific and gold sunburst stripes, because again, she couldn't wait to get back over there and top up her tan by the beach. My understanding is that our official heraldic authority, the College of Arms, would be tasked with updating all of the coats of arms to reflect the new reign of King Charles III after Her Majesty's death. That is my understanding. Harry is the son of a monarch. He is not an heir apparent anymore. He is no longer the grandson of a monarch, only a deceased monarch. So changes would be in order to that coat of arms. Harry was appointed a five-pointed label when he turned 18 on that coat of arms. And a label, by the way, is what you see on these coats of arms going across the shields and across the necks. Those things with sort of white sheets with various tabs on, they are the label. He was appointed a five-pointed label originally and it was charged with red Spencer seashells, if you will, in memory of his mother Diana on the first and the third and the fifth points. Do you see? Well, these five pointed labels were given to all the grandchildren of Queen Elizabeth, bar William, because he's more important, so he gets his own affair going on, but all the rest of the grandchildren, they got these five pointed labels. But now that we have a new monarch, Harry's label should now actually be reduced to three points as the son of a monarch. And it was agreed in 2002 that the two blank points on that label would vanish, leaving just three charged, as they put it. The labels are charged with three red seashells. So I can't say for certain, and I'm certainly not an expert on heraldry, but I would imagine that the same 
protocols would apply to Meghan's, to her coat of arms as the Duchess of Sussex, I would imagine that really they should be altered there too. But either way, this coat of arms does not represent both of them. It only represents Meghan. And isn't that something to chew on? As a palate cleanser, I would like to wish you all a happy Shrove Tuesday. It's Shrove Tuesday here in the Kingdom, which is a day I always enjoy. Mummy especially does wonderful pancakes. I like pancakes. I don't know if it's like this abroad or if you share the name Shrove Tuesday. I know you don't everywhere, but we have great big pancakes like this and you fold them all over and they're all rather floppy and then a little bit crispy. And I like to have them with lashings of sugar and lemon juice. And I like to have them hot and I like to have a dollop of cool ice cream with uh, some sort of sharp flavor on the side. Delicious. And I like the mixture of the hot and cold. And yes, I'm fantasizing over it because I'm, as you know, I'm on a particular regime which bans anything apart from meat and eggs at the moment. So I cannot indulge and it is heartbreaking. I would love to indulge, but I'm bringing it up because the Royal Foundation shared uh, a recipe favored by the late queen. It's the recipe that she sent to President Eisenhower in 1960, we hear. And it's uh, a drop scone of a sort or Scotch pancake. So it's not the traditional size that we have here in the kingdom or at least the English part of the kingdom it's more similar to an American style uh, breakfast pancake and uh, I also love them done with maple syrup when I've been in Canada that's what my, my friend's father used to serve up to me every morning delicious uh, maple syrup uh, little pancakes like this with bacon with gorgeous little strips of bacon ooh, ooh la la Ooh, divine. Well, I can still have bacon, but not the maple syrup, unfortunately. Uh, but there you are. You can find the recipe via the, the Royal Collection. And just quickly on the subject of what I'm eating, Tara Potter says, Hello, River. I'm dying to know how you're managing without sugar in your diet. How do you manage cravings? I'm sure I'm not the only fruit interested. Thank you, Tara Potter, my dear. Yes, it is my 39th day on what is known as the carnivore diet. So all I have eaten is steak, butter, bacon, eggs, and a little bit of chicken and some salmon. But mainly it is steak and butter and salt. Nothing else, no other seasonings, garnishings, no plants, no vegetables, that is all. And I've got stricter over the last week or two. I've eliminated sparkling water, so all I can drink is water. And I've eliminated coffee. I've taken it down to decaf coffee, but I'm having to eliminate that as well. And, uh, you know, it's not as tough as it was to begin with. The first few weeks were the toughest. I can slowly feel that I'm getting into a certain rhythm, rhythm and a cadence. And I want to reiterate, as I did in the video that I made about it, that I am not encouraging anyone else to do as I will. I am attempting to cure a specific problem for however long it takes, and then I will return to my normal way of eating but I'm going to dedicate myself to the task at hand. Uh, you know, it comes down to part luck, part health and part attitude, how you go into these sorts of endeavors. And for me, I have simply no alternative. If I'm to lead a happy life, then I must cure myself of the issue that is troubling me at the moment. And therefore I must abide by this regime, which is the only one that has had some proven results. So there is simply no alternative. The first 10 days, my dear, without sugar and without uh, cravings. Well, I didn't get by well at all in the first week or two. As I mentioned before, the, the fatigue was off the charts. I would put, there were actually a few days when I came to do a broadcast and I just couldn't, I could not bring myself to collect notes together to get into the frame of mind it was absolutely impossible it was like swimming in treacle i wasn't in pain or anything i didn't get crushing head headaches some people have migraines and suffer terribly i had very bad fatigue and very bad uh, palpitations which i've still had a couple of times i actually put that down to the sparkling water because i didn't have some palpitations in the night for many weeks and then i gulped down 
uh, some sparkling water one day because I hadn't had it for a while and the palpitations returned. I don't know if they were connected. And again, I'm not suggesting anything to anyone. A few people on my video about this that I made, well, firstly, the comments were amazing. So many hundreds of you, hundreds of you have experienced healing, but I want to make it very plain that I'm not recommending this diet to anyone. A few people said, I'm taking inspiration. I'm going to start it because you have. Don't do that. I actually asked you not to do that because of me. Do it because of what you've looked into and what you think, because just as many thousands of carnivore dieters come forward to say this has absolutely changed their lives and healed their problems, I'm sure there are just as many in the vegan community that do it. In fact, I know there are. And in the Mediterranean diet and every single diet under the sun. So I'm not advocating, I'm just sharing for those of you that are a bit nosy about what I'm up to. But I do take my responsibility seriously enough to tell you again and again, don't do as I do. I'm just telling you what I'm going through and what I'm doing. I also have been fasting. I did a 24 hour fast and then a 48 hour fast, a dry fast, so no water either. It's actually much easier than you'll think. I'm on a fast now. I haven't eaten for the past 24 hours. I will go on to do 48 and I might push it and go on for a third day because it takes you into what is known as autophagy. No, autoph... <laughs> I knew I was going to get it wrong. <laughs> Tophagy. Uh, autophagy. Autophagy. Not autophagy. Autophagy, which is where the... You basically start eating yourself <laughs> instead of food. No, your, your body starts eating away at any damaged tissues within your body or the damaged parts of you after a few days and people find healing. Uh, it's really not dangerous when you're in as good a state as health as I am. People from religions all over the world fast all of the time and I found it no problem at all to do 48 hours. I ended up enjoying it and it can be very healing. So that is part of my journey as well and also makes it a bit cheaper than buying meat seven days a week. I can do it for just four or five. But it is the experience that at this moment in time I'm craving rather than the food. I get moments of pining for food, but not craving anymore at all. Once it's out of your system, you know, I've had no, not one grain of sugar for 39 days for the first time in my life, I suppose you could say, uh, or, or plant or vegetable. And yes, you do get some of those cravings initially, but like anything, it wears off completely, uh, very quickly. Um, that's just about habit forming, isn't it? That goes, but I still and always will have the craving for the experience, the shared experience with friends, with my companion, with my loved ones, with, uh, you know, any sort of rituals, coffee break with mummy. And yesterday I was walking through town and two days before that I was walking through a different city where they have a wonderful mall. I love going to malls. I find them so relaxing and they play sort of chart music. You know, when a, when a mall isn't too busy, not in the weekend rush, but these undercover shop places, they're huge and cavernous. And it's wonderful to mooch around and music. And usually one of my favorite things to do is just take a cup of tea on my own or find some little shop with a sausage roll that sells, you know, homemade ice creams, this kind of thing, enjoy myself. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. What was I gonna do, sit down? in a cafe and just ask for a slice of bacon but make sure it's cooked in butter you know one doesn't want to do that it's not as much fun so it's those things that I will always miss and you know lighting up a crafty cigarette if I want one as well because they're off as well at the moment they're off the menu but what it all boils down to my dear Tara my dear Tara Potter when you ask how I do it is how much you want it is how much you want it if you want it and you know that in my case I see no alternative then you do it you know you buckle in and do it and enjoy the ride. And I know lots of you have done this as well. I have members of my family that don't and won't, and it's rather frustrating, but you have to, one has to concede that it is their own journey they're on. My daddy, for example, uh, he's terrible. He will get all kinds of issues come up and uh, he might whinge about them. Well, that's, that's unfair. He's not a great whinger. He keeps a lot about it to himself, but when you do ask him, because one, if there's one thing I find that is worse than me being in pain and me suffering, which has been seldom in my life, I'm happy to say. But when I have found the one thing that I hate more than that is my loved ones in pain. And I know that many of you know about this, but when a loved one is suffering or in pain, it's just something you can't really do anything about, isn't it? It makes you feel helpless 
and for me it's on my mind you know it's something I can't really shake knowing that they are in pain so and um, it's the same with daddy he he's had various aches and pains and goings on in his life and I'm not going to go into the private details of that but suffice to say whereas I would look quite forensically at what I can do because I understand that what I put in to my body is what I get out uh, of it not in an evangelical way because I don't live in any sort of pure way at all I throw, throw a lot of abuse at my body but I know when it needs healing I listen to it and I don't push past certain boundaries if you will so I'm not an advocate of clean and healthy living whatsoever. I like a little bit of dirty living because some of that is the joy of life for me. It's different for everyone. But with somebody like Daddy, he will not really look at what's really going on in his the chemistry of his body and inside of it. And he'll still stuff down uh, bits and bobs that he shouldn't when he's aching or when he's hurting, whereas where I will try and attack it and not just put up with my sufferings as the status quo I simply won't accept it and sometimes a little bit of denial might pay off as being rather healthy because as I said part of it is luck a lot of it can be luck what comes up with your health and what doesn't uh, I know extraordinarily healthy living people who have come down with the worst things one can imagine and vice versa a lot of it is luck a lot of it is the health that the healthy lifestyle you lead or not and a lot of it and a part of it is attitude I truly believe that and sometimes you've got to pull that attitude out from inside of yourself and find the chutzpah to get on with it my dear and that is what I'm trying to do for now but back to the subject of Harry and Petronella Wyatt wrote an article Petronella Wyatt we've spoken about on a number of occasions and she is well, she has known Camilla since she was 18 years old, which she mentions in this article. And she writes that the talk is that Harry did not want to be in the same room as Queen Camilla on his recent in and out to Claret's house. She said, Harry, I hear, preferred not to be in the same room as his stepmother when he spoke to the king about his cancer diagnosis. That might have been at Buckingham Palace, actually, mightn't it? keeps slipping from my mind which one it was because they're close in proximity anyway wherever it was she says he didn't want to be in the same room as Camilla this is what she's been told and informed of well I shall make two distinct points here one is that actually if that's true in defense of Harry to some extent I would feel the same I would feel the same about having private time if I only had between you know five minutes and half an hour with the king depending on who you believe uh, I would feel the same uh, after an initial hello obviously I would make sure to say hello to the couple but then I would want private time with my father if, if time was so slim I think that would be fair uh, I am what's known in my friendship group as a one-on-one -on <laughs> they know me as the one on one because I've got friends many who are mutual friends and many we do hang out and have a fabulous time you know clubs pubs bars that's all wonderful I love getting us all together and having a gossip around the table but it's uh, for certain circumstances and under certain conditions I loathe it for example if one was to meet up with a friend uh, that one hadn't seen for a few weeks in a pub I would hate to be joined by someone else whether a friend of theirs or a mutual friend I don't want some three-way affair I like to give someone my entire attention and have them give me their entire attention I, uh, and I'm very awkward and very uncomfortable inside they don't know but inside if they if my eyes have to dart about between let's say four and five different people around a sofa uh, fair enough if you're having separate conversations and gossips between yourself but if you have to kind of someone's talking and you all give them attention then it comes to you and then it goes away I can't do it some people do it with a plum a plum many people do but I can't it makes me feel extraordinarily self-conscious uh, I feel uncomfortable you know I'm quite particular with my surroundings I have to have my ducks in a row and I don't mean to do it as a diva I just cannot hear and think properly when things are coming at me from different angles <laughs> and I'm sharing this because I know it'll apply to some of you as well my dear it's just one of those things and I'm not saying that that applies to Harry what I am saying is that there are certain times where there are certain intimacy between 
two people is warranted. So, you know, I, I would certainly understand why he wouldn't want Camilla there for the entire engagement. But, but we must also bear in mind the fact if the king, for example, was insistent that his wife is present for the entire summit, we do have to remember that she, as queen, has also been roundly insulted. Insulted. And that is in no uncertain terms. It's there in black and white print in that book. Insulted again and again, accused of all kinds of machinations and all kinds of deviousness, plotting, strategizing. Uh, an attack on her character with his pen as a blade. So Harry is not the only one protective of his wife. And perhaps it might be a surprise to him that the king might make it a condition that visually she will be standing by him and he will be standing by her. Harry is not the only one. And other members of the royal family are the ones who have been utterly loyal. Uh, Harry is the one who has been in indiscreet and indecent. Petronella Wyatt says, I have known Camilla since she was 18 and she is palpably incapable of the scheming Harry has often accused her of. To what has sometimes been to her detriment, she is incapable of machinations of any kind. With her clean tradition as the daughter of country gentry, her complexion that rejects makeup and the elements, and her forthright, genuine approach. The closest she has come to scheme is on a scrabble board. <laughs> After Diana's death, and when I was deputy editor of The Spectator, I sometimes breakfasted with Mark Bolland, Charles's deputy private secretary. Without wishing to betray any confidences, and then she goes on to, I received the distinct impression that it was Charles who desired to marry Camilla, whilst she was content with a less formal arrangement. The subject of her one day becoming queen was never broached. There are some people who are devoid of ambition and snobbery, and Camilla is one of them. Thus, I do not understand Harry's bile and cannot sympathise with it. Well, make of that what you will, my dears. Pick the words of whoever you fancy. J.R. Moorringer, in collaboration with Prince Harry, or Petronella Wyatt. I know where I'm inclined to butter my bread. Although, sadly, I'm not allowed any bread, but I am allowed lashings of butter. Enjoy your pancakes. Think of me as you're munching into them. <laughs> and I will just dream about gorging myself on them next year if I'm off of this particular culinary regime by then. Yawnsville, Yawnsville, Yawnsville. Thank you for being delicious. I'll see you next time, my dears. Take care and toodle pit.